housewives hold a great many secrets, tis true. Beyond this door lies the Holocron Vault. The Holocrons contain the most closely guarded secrets of the Jedi Order. All right, let's talk about uh, Dave Filoni and uh, who he is. So I think I think he's probably the most, and probably for the last at least decade, easily, Mike, uh, probably the most influential person in Star Wars. I know it goes back to like, for those that don't even know, he's the guy who he's like the five six five foot six guy who wears the cowboy Indiana Jones hat. He's always got cowboy boots on. He's one of us. Like he is a fanboy of fanboys. Um, he did King of the Hill. He was like the illustrator for King of the Hill before that. Then he did the Airbender show over there on Nickelodeon for years. He really was a lot into doing those cartoon illustrations. Um, he eventually applied for a job with Lucas and didn't think he was going to get it because whatever. And it turned out it was for Clone Wars. It turned out Lucas loved him. And now he's become like the illegitimate stepchild of Kennedy and Lucas. And, and, and honestly, he's done a lot of good. So his thing one of the best parts that I think about them is when they form the story group and they won't, the story group won't say it. And what the story group is, um, it's a bunch of people who keep the canon together. So you, they don't tell you, no, they don't tell you, you can do something. They tell you, no, you can't do something. So right. if you're writing one of the books, anything in the new canon, video games, anything that follows through the new canon, uh, they are the ones that kind of approve it. They have approved some terrible things, a couple of terrible things like witting <laughs> wood and knitting for some reason is canon in Star Wars now, which I don't think that needed to be in canon. But we've well, got Pablo Hidalgo there, um, who has run story through Lucasfilm for a really long time now. Yes. And, and that's become a lot more of a of a real title over the last, say, 10 years or so than it ever was before that. Just because you had all that expanded universe stuff with novels and, and comic books and and you name it. Um, but then when it really came down to what are we going to do with, with some animated shows, how are we going to make these things fit in uh, and we interweave them with the films that we're planning on doing with Disney and the ones that have already happened. Um, and at that point, uh, story became really, really important. And Pablo essentially got his official job at that point. And so the part um, that ties in with Dave with that is that Dave is the, was the unofficial like leader and band per like get the, let's get the group together and kind of doing it because he yeah. already knew the direction where a lot of stuff was going. And as much as he creds Lucas, a lot of the stuff in my opinion and a lot of other fans opinions is if not the direct result of Dave, it's related to Dave somehow that he got that boat in, in motion. And what, yep. and one so one of the great parts about this, the story group is for those that don't know it. And, and I, I bet you some of you listening now are listening to this to figure this out. The non-canon stuff, how the, it all used to go through Del Rey, and then the comic books obviously were through Marvel, and then ended up switching over to Dark Horse. It was just kind of the biggest bitter one. But the problem with a lot of that stuff was there were inconsistencies because uh, Lucas wanted to have his thumb on everything, and sometimes that vision of people's there was not a group to keep it in contention, so there's only so much he could do. He was also working on other projects, and everything else, so they couldn't really get it going. So a lot of times when you read a lot of those old books, the same theme was just duplicated over and over and over. They would just use a different character. Heir of the Empire is one of the perfect examples for this, where they, the cloning thing, which also happened in like four or five other things and unfortunately showed up in the new movie, all happened there. So they got rid of that and cleaned it up a lot. They, they still use Del We'll Rey talk about a, your unfortunately some other time. We will. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but, but they, so what they really did was they took Del Rey and said, fine, we do want your top writers. Uh, we're going to move it a little bit because a lot of stuff was a little bit more fan fiction that they converted into 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 a writing house. So we do want to have great writers on it. So we want your top writers. And the only thing that really had a plan was Shadows. Shadow, that's Shadows of the Empire for, for those of you that aren't aware. Um, mm. It was originally planned to be an animated show. Um, and instead what they did was they rolled out full marketing as if it would be a movie for this storyline. That ended up being um, I mean, toys. Uh, there was a soundtrack for it, um, comic books, book, uh, obviously a book, um, and all kinds of other peripheral marketing as if it were a movie, but without the movie. That mm -hmm. had a big plan. But other than that, you're right. Everything else expanded universe was either uh, an author like Timothy Zahn coming to them and saying, this is my idea. What can't I do? Who can't I kill? Um, you know, or kind of, kind of, but I, back in those, back, and you're right, but back in those days, it was more, they would give you an outline. You would yeah. present them a thing, they would give you an outline. So there were certain things they said, you can use these, but this is what you have to have in the book. 
Now it's more like you can use whatever you want unless we tell you no. Dave, you know, obviously with his animation thing coming in, he he started to create these characters and these story arcs of his own, that's, uh, starting with Clone Wars. And it wasn't really accepted all that much at first, at least right at the beginning, until people started to really latch on to his character specifically and how good he was creating this sort of this new canon for for Lucas. And I think once fans started to really get a hold of that, especially characters like Ahsoka, uh, and then later things like Rebels and that kind of thing, they became so good and so entrenched in uh, what people were hoping for, for Star Wars, that they hadn't maybe had in a long time, that all of a sudden they said, wait, who's the guy that created all this stuff? Oh, and oh Dave, Dave Filoni. Oh, that guy. Okay. We need to pay more attention to him. And that led to him being kind of the Teflon Don of Star Wars. Like he yes. has made certain comments that other people in Star Wars has before, like Star Wars is for children. But how Dave says it is different. He, how Dave explains it is, don't tell me it's not for children because when did you see it? When you were seven with your dad? So you want me to do something to ruin that for that? But he keeps re he keeps re upping it so that the, a new generation gets a new Star Wars, right? I mean, I talk to people that are young and they say, my Star Wars is Clone Wars. And yeah. I go, oh, yeah. People that wow, like that's, are that's crazy to think that, you know, where I think about, say, my wife, who's a little younger than me, and she says, my Star Wars is the prequels. Well, you know, our Star Wars is the original trilogy, but everybody gets to get their own Star Wars. Uh, you know, sorry for those of you that got resistance is your Star Wars, but uh, <laughs> but, for, but the rest the rest of us all got a really great Star Wars. And I think Dave Filoni is instrumental in being the reinventor for a new generation of what Star Wars can be moving forward. And so without him, I don't know that that would have happened. Maybe so it would have. Yeah, but. maybe it would have, but I don't think it would have either. And, and this is to that point. There used to be two very distinct camps. The distinct mm -hmm. camp was, I'm an original movie Star Wars person. Nothing else matters. And then there was a, I'm extended universe person. Nothing matters besides that. And now it's kind of like, you hear this a lot whenever you go to an event, whenever you do anything. And I think Dave has a large part in this is Star Wars is for everybody, but not all of Star Wars is for you. And I think, you know, yeah. there's always going to be some loud naysayers about there. There's always going to be some, you know, basement boys or whatever that are sitting there always grumpity, grumpity, yelling for meatloaf. But like the most of the part, when you go to, <laughs> when you go to a lot of these Star Wars things, even if we disagree on stuff, like, at least it's semi-respectful. Like, and at least people will bring good points. They just won't be like, it sucks. Like, yeah, the internet probably does a lot. Yeah. I yeah, but not but not at something like Celebration. And I think that's a good segue into Dave's creations, his characters. And I'm going to just talk about my last experience at Celebration, actually two Celebrations ago, when I first saw Ashley Eckstein's Her Universe table. Oh, geez. And yeah. I could, this is when I finally realized just what a new generation of Star Wars fans was. Mm -hmm. When I saw a line of girls... Wrapped around Ashley Eckstein's table. A Ashley Eckstein is the voice actress for Ahsoka Tano, for those that don't know. The, the line wrapped around her table just to meet her, not to buy clothes, not to get autographs, not to do anything, just literally to say hello and shake her hand. And how many girls were dressed up as Ahsoka in that line was absolutely mind-blowing to me. When I saw that, I came right home. I told all my nerd friends, I'm like, you got to stock up on everything Ahsoka right now. You have no idea what this character is about to be. And everyone told me I was crazy. They're like, that character is annoying. They call her Snips for a reason. I'm yeah. like, you don't understand, man. This is something new. And sure enough, now now look at Ahsoka now. So, um, so as somebody who's going to get hate, because I actually thought the Ahsoka character, even as Snips, was a better character than the Anakin character. Um me too. Yeah, but the, when you talk about her and her line, the craziest part, and you'll know this, and people can go look at look at how expensive her stuff is. Now, you've <laughs> been to her shows before. You've seen her at shows before, Mike, and say that I'm lying. Her stuff sells, and it sells out. It sells to dudes. It sells out. Girl oh, stuff. Dude. Yeah, dudes, dudes wearing girl stuff. In like we, extra extra large. Yes, yeah. So I was I, so I told this story before, and I'll tell it again. Last celebration, two time they had two cool Ahsoka things. My wife was like, "Dude, I want one of these." Two Tano, things. yeah, the Tano shirt. Which, yep. And she, they were buying everything, and my wife's medium. They didn't even have mediums in it. They had they had super X small. Maybe I don't even think they had that left on that. And that was day two because day yep. one we went into the regular shop to buy the the there was generic and one of these shows. I'll show you what one of the shirts is. And if, you, if you're watching galleries, you'll see it too. It's the Mandalorian shirt that Dave has on. Yep. I have that shirt. That was a cool shirt. That thing sold out first day. The other shirt that sold out, she couldn't get it. And she was very upset. In, but luckily, they re-rolled it out, so she has it now. Is There's a purple shirt that says Sokatan on it. And it, they sold it from extra small to 
double XL. By the second day, I saw, I'm not a small dude, all right, <laughs> but I saw dudes twice my size. The, the jammed in. are up here. The belly roll's coming out, jammed into those shirts, man. And I was like, look, I always thought she was good. I thought everything was great. I have obviously stocked up on that character because I believe in that character. I believe in Dave characters. Uh, and he's not the only one. But that, oh, my gosh, that was crazy. That was, you, I, you would not think. And Mike, maybe I'm wrong, but like 20 no, years ago, when the first, when the when the prequels came out, and there was the big war in Star Wars between, you know, uh, what's really Star Wars? Is the prequel really Star Wars, or is it really the original three trilogies? And then after that, when they did the canon, non-canon break, well, is canon really Star Wars, or is Lucas, which we'll talk about how much Lucas had involved in all that, or is only the stuff Lucas did by himself really Star Wars? And then you see a character where you know that that character was just six to eight years ago thought of as a, like you said, annoying little girl named Snips. And now yep. you're seeing dudes yeah. who always aren't the most, you know, shirt sure, type guys. That, well, not just that, but they're usually the guys that are like, kind of like, it's my childhood. I want to relive my childhood. I don't want anything else. And these yeah. dudes are, are pushing themselves into very small shirts. And like, there was, <laughs> there was more guys there and there was plenty of women. Don't get me wrong. There was more guys there wearing that shirt, and there was more women giving a crooked eye, like "I hate you for taking that shirt." Right? Yeah, because I so, wanted one. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted one. To so me, like, to me, it was seeing all the little girls, um, and and I think that that's a huge thing that's been missing in Star Wars for a long time. And and obviously, Lucasfilm, whomever it is, whether it's Dave or Kathleen Kennedy or whomever, uh, is a big focus on the girl characters right now, and they are crushing it. They they I, are Ahsoka think, is at the top of the list, but I think. You got Afra, you got Rhett, you got Sabine Wren. You've got, I mean, you've got the whole list going down. And to see that new generation be that excited, it's the same kind of excitement that we had when we were kids. That That's amazing to me. And I love that that exists. And I think we owe it to Dave. Um, and I think that we're going to see a lot of these characters now become really integral parts of the live action world for Star Wars, the animated world moving forward product lines you are never not going to see an ahsoka product out you're just yeah. not going to anymore she's like luke you're never going to not see a luke on a shelf you're never going to not see an ahsoka on a shelf not anymore those days I are done she, i think she's more han solo because she's a lot cooler than oh, you know what is, i mean so like yeah you know what i mean though yeah. so this is this is a good point that you just brought up and this is kind of going back to dave so let's look at what dave did right so dave did clone wars we know ahsoka came out of clone wars rebels comes out okay mm -hmm. next up rebels comes out who do we have in rebels Sabine. You are my favorite, Sabine Wren. Sabine Wren. Well, you also got Hera, but like Sabine Wren becomes the winner of this, right? Absolutely. Like she is the winner of that show. And <clears> at <throat> the beginning for the first two seasons, people, when I go to the LCS, people are like, you're not watching that garbage, are you? And I'm like, this is good stuff. Like, Well, she's the one with the dynamic story arc, whereas Hera doesn't have that. Hera is a strong character right from the beginning, and she doesn't really change all that much other than maybe her feelings for Kanan. But – you know, sort of, they, they go in and out, but Sabine has a really, really like. In, uh, in, you're right in the animated world, in the actual canon world, there's some great storylines, um, especially yeah. how Kit, Jairus and her met. I mean, she so they do develop that character very well. I just mean from a viewership, from a new, from from a new right. fan base, seeing the, that character's arc and, and her dynamic arc that she gets, um, I think that's why people can identify with her because she is. In many ways, she's the secondary hero of that show. Mm -hmm. So um, then you, so then you can do all that, and you can, you can, you can. Rebels, great. That's it's a success. I don't think anybody now, after it's done, can say it's not a success. But what's our next step? So our next step, and a lot of people don't do this, and I think this is what you're kind of getting into, Mike, is Forces of Destiny. Yes, because what he did was he took these little clips, and it's all female characters. They're great storylines. I know when my daughter was three, she would repeatedly watch all these because it was good enough to show to a kid. They weren't, there's two in them. They're kind of a little shaky. Yeah. Yeah. So it came out with a line too. And we'll talk about the toy line later, but he came out with all these little clips of forces of destiny and they were perfectly edible and they were for even younger viewers. So now, I mean, probably my kids at three were too young to watch them, but now you're talking about grabbing in five-year-olds. So now we got Dave doing this web series that ends up becoming something you could find on TV or everything else. And what they start doing are these little mini series where it's all focused on strong female characters and the, the credit to Dave is he doesn't pawn them off as either being too aggressive or, or needing help or something like that. He actually legitimately just makes them like, hey, they're 
just like any other character, like a Han Solo or a Luke, where that I mean, Han Solo, in my opinion, was one of the best uh, character developments. Right? It was just, yeah. it just was. He was like he. It was cool. It, he just was. You didn't have to do too much explaining. You expected the next thing to come out of his line mouth to be something that was cool. That was yeah, kind of Western. None of us wanted to be Luke. We all wanted no, to be Han. Nobody no, wanted Han to be Solo, Luke. By far. <laughs> Han Solo and Leia were the two best characters. Well, I wanted to be Lando. I yeah. wanted to be Lando. I thought he was the cool. I thought he was the cooler Han, but you know, it's the same idea. I, no, I, I I will debate. Like I like Lando, but Han by far is best. But that's what I'm saying. So now, so now he took like even characters that were coming out in movies, and people were kind of like downplaying their power or downplaying whatever they were downplaying about it, and saying whatever it was. He ended up taking these characters and really giving them strong little. I think what are the clips like three minutes long, Mike? Four minutes long? I, yeah, I think that's minutes. yeah three and three and change. They were. Yeah. Uh, I think they were shorter when they were on YouTube and then when they got released onto whatever the next either disc or on right onto Disney plus, they, they a- added a few pieces of material back in and they got a little longer. Um, I can't remember, but there were two different, there were two different edits of each one, I think. Yeah. So, so what they did was they ended up putting it on the web and then after the web, they ended up transitioning it to, uh, on demand for Disney Junior or Disney, Disney now XD. Disney Disney Junior. XD that's a XD. Disney XD so they did on Disney XD yep. whatever the younger yep. one is so seven and unders yep. yes so Disney XD so they ended up doing an on demand for Disney XD they promoted the show during Rebels so that you could like all their promos were on Rebels and um, then you, I think there was two seasons or whatever but it would give a small ten minute backstory almost like from a certain point of view the book and that's kind of how they did it and and that led into a certain point of like th- that's what the crazy stuff is like. Dave does something like that, it becomes a success and then leads to other people doing projects similar to his. And you're seeing that with The Mandalorian now. So then after that, he does what is arguably, in my opinion, uh, probably his worst work. He does Resistance. Yeah. Let's talk about Resistance because here's somebody that doesn't know much about Resistance. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, obviously um, watching it at the time. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Resistance and not get too into it. What is Resistance? So Resistance is a show that I think was what I think what Dave was attempting to do. This is my guess. He was attempting to make it even younger. I think he saw the success with Forces of Destiny. And rather than rather than take sort of like the seven, eight, nine, ten year old where he was kind of targeting um, Clone Wars and Rebels before that, he, I think he tried to kind of knock it down to a slightly younger level. He added in a really ridiculous character um, named Nico who's uh, a green Klaatu, who's really a tough character to watch. Um, and storylines that were, uh, they're, they're, they're vague. Um, you, then he tried to throw in a little fan service by putting Poe in there um, and BB-8, BBA. And, and, and a little bit of like Leia stuff and, and, and that kind of thing. And it was, it just didn't, it just didn't jive. It, 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 it just sort of felt like work. It was so, tough to watch. Yeah. So the, just like that was the first one where I was like, Oh, I get what people say about the beginning of his shows, not being that good and the end being good. And the end was not good, but it was passable. It okay. was, it was at least, at least got watchable. It was yeah, almost it got, unwatchable television. Uh, at first. It, it was struggle time. It was really struggle at the beginning it was. to try to, he tried, he tried to introduce too many new characters. Yeah. Which is tough to say considering clone work, but like, he was using Paul, which at best is a second to third rate character. BB-8, yep. which is never is, you know, I mean, he's probably like the sixth most popular droid, if that. Maybe even actually depends if you consider Grievous <laughs> a droid at this point or not. But like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he, he he was using all these things, and they were either popping in and popping out. And the story arc was leading up to like the First Order, kind of like Inception, but but there already been stories out in canon about how the First Order was getting started. And stuff like right. that. So it was kind of just thrown together a little poorly. I do like um, I did like the Yeager character. I thought he was fairly well rounded. Um, he was about the only saving grace in the show. The voice actor did a good job. There was nothing annoying about him. He he had sort of a uh, regality to him. Yeager, I thought Yeager was actually a good character. I thought that he was well rounded. I thought he had a a regality to him that made him feel like what we would expect from a Filoni character. Whereas the other characters felt rushed they didn't have real they were silly um and annoying to be honest and some were stereotypical like it was really punch hole on a lot of them i do think uh towards the end the one that i'm not gonna get into the whole thing but there's a traitor from the group that gets in for it i thought that was actually kind of good towards the end and somebody's daughter started to 
developed to and was pretty good. All and said, maybe it's not for us. You know what I mean? Like, we're not yeah. going to know the payoff for that uh, till pro- I would think probably at least a decade uh, because it is so. I do think it's like the seventh, seven, the you know, the six through eight year old demographic. And, and and the animation is not my style. It is more Airbender or more, you know. Um, I do know people, I do know adults too, that thought that the animation was good. Um, and, and I could see why one might like that style. I think the best animation is still Clone Wars, in my opinion. Um, although I do like the sort of Macquarie-ish direction that Rebels took. Um, but I think that I, I think that the animation, it didn't matter how good the animation was. The rest of it was so weak. You know, first of all, put it this way. It lasted only two seasons. That's never a good thing. Um, and then you have you have things like Clone Wars and Rebels that did resonate with older audiences, even though they weren't meant for older audiences. Clearly, there was something missing in this show. Now, okay. that doesn't mean, you know, he's going to have a misstep. He's, the, the, the guy is not God. He's not perfect. He's going to yeah. have a misstep. And he probably got – he may have gotten told, hey, this needs to be for a lower a lower age bracket. What can you do? And he or might he just try something new. Yeah, or yeah. And it just didn't go – it just um, didn't go well. So let's go but back to Clone Wars. Swing and you miss. Yeah, so let's go back to Clone Wars because yeah. I will agree with Rebels and everything else. But let's not forget where Clone Wars was. That first off, the movie that they did for they, this, the first movie that had that terrible animation that they did for Clone Wars, and you guys can all go look back, look that up. We're, we're not going to go over that. Then they <laughs> the samurai, the, the samurai Jack stuff. You mean the samurai Jack stuff? Yes. yes. Then they had so we're looking at Cartoon Network, right? Because that's where they're putting this all out. You have the actual movie, which has three poses: arm crossed, pointing finger, arms on hips. Wasn't that the three moves that they had in the whole thing? Yeah, the animation right. was yep. terrible. Yep, it was bad. You can say Star Wars is for kids, and this is where I'll kind of debate it. You're that error, you were not. If you're putting it on Cartoon Network, at that error, you're talking about Space Ghost, Mystery Science Three Thousand. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah, like more for adults. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So that I think was a little bit of a development thing when they put the stuff on XD with CD with Rebels. I know he had to tone it down to a, you know, it's seven plus there. Um, so maybe it was, but I still think it was a little racy for seven years. But who knows? But that still was good. That was all inclusive. This one might have been like like Forces of Destiny. I loved it because my kid loved it. I don't know how much I would have loved it if I didn't wasn't forced to watch it. Um, but that being said, I, I like know. what it did though. I like yeah, I, I like its too. purpose. So Which this is, what, um, and I think that the marketing that was associated with it was great too. A really great yeah, figure right. line. They had a comic book that extended every episode. So if you had say a three minute episode or four minute episode, you then had a 23, four five page comic that would extend that story out further. And I thought that was really smart. Then have toys, uh, which were girl based um, so that you, you had that at home play value along with it. So it was really a very immersive thing for something that was really only a three or four minute episode. It's, Kind of brilliant. So I like I like the impetus behind it. Whether we would have liked it as fans on our own, who knows? But I do like the idea and where where it sends the marketing and and where it sends the fan base. And what a good what what and we'll probably get into this later on. A, a really good part about that is a lot of that stuff the retailers didn't have faith in. So yep. it went right. Oh god, it went on sale real we're gonna... quick. It went on sale real quick. That's all I'm gonna say. But it, but yeah. that was great because now you're get now you're not paying top price you're not paying top price for a toy or a dollar or whatever for a youth kid because the prices for some of that stuff is out of control anyways you know what i mean so that was really good yeah. so that worked out really well yep. but it also established that you could develop you know leia is a strong female character and when you get into some of the writings in the book like bloodlines the author who writes yeah. bloodlines does is probably she probably does one of the best jobs of character development on Leia. She is like everything I think anybody who I've talked to personally has imagined Leia to be a strong character, not a strong female, a strong overall character. Okay. And right. that's what they did with, that's what they did with forces of destiny. Now resistance fell off a little bit, but then what does he do? He gets back up on his horse and he does Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Yeah. And what he's doing in the Mandalorian is really crazy. Oh. Because <laughs> Sorry. That's awesome. No, no, no. That's good. So what he does in The Mandalorian is really cool because when you look on Insight, you're like, oh, of course they of course they got Dave on The Mandalorian. But think about this. Dave, all his experience has been in animation. He doesn't know anything about live. It was great that it was a hit, but you brought in John and you bring him in and they're co 
directing, like they're the co-bosses, right, at this point. So, and then, and Galleries will get in, Galleries gets into it too, if you haven't watched that on Disney Plus, the after part, they talk about it. But what the running theory is, is this, that John's there to teach Dave how to do live action, because Dave isn't going to take over all content for tele- television, you know what I mean? Which isn't really television. Well, he's a, and he's a storyboarder. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, like that, if that, that animation experience comes in handy on any show, especially when you're talking about a budget that is essentially television. Now, look, I know Disney Plus budget is not Fox budget. And a million to five million dollars an episode is is, but it's still not a movie. So you've got to figure out a way to cut budget somewhere along the line, and you need a guy who's really good at telling story quickly, and that's something that Dave is very good at. So if you've got a guy who understands story, he's a fan like all of us, so he knows what we want because he wants it. Um, he's you know, not unlike JJ Abrams, which Sorry, right, we'll again. get into JJ. We'll get into JJ some other time. Um, but yeah, he's in charge of the writing group. Um, but he's a fan, like like many of the other guys are. And I think that um, th- those things combined, his ability to storyboard, his ability to tell story well and quickly on a budget, as well as being head of story. I mean, I think he was he's the. There's no other option. I mean, he's got to be the guy. And um, I think we all can agree that he's come through. To a yeah. finer point, though, I think what they're doing there, and I really do, is. If you ever like Dave, one of the big stories is he would like tag along Lucas just like incessantly, like just tag along, just tag along, talk to him all the time, tag along, tag along time. So he could get the feeling of how he did stuff because there were certain things that he didn't even know on how to do Star Wars stuff, even with the storyboarding, even though he already had experience. So he already tackled that. And now you see him doing with John. You're like, why would he be tagging that along? Well, because you're now going to put him just like you did with the with the uh, story group or the canon group you're going to put him in charge of all television that doesn't mean just animation that doesn't mean live like this demo where they had different directors and different writers come through he's going to be now the person that explains to them the vision of it's no longer lucas's vision it is now dave's vision and it's going to come down to that he's going to get there and when they graduate you're going to see him go up and then john's going to take him over into the movie part and then john's going to oversee all that stuff and if you watch galleries, which is the thing on Disney Plus, I suggest you do, there's points in there where you can see even stuff that Dave clicks. Like everybody's like, Dave's a genius. Dave knew all this stuff. Dave knew all this stuff. And you hear John talk about certain things. And the things that John talks about is is not animation stuff because he'll get back and say like, oh, I didn't even know how to do some of this stuff till Dave like straightened it out for me. I was having trouble with it. But he'll start talking about certain elements of like fight scenes or how to deal with directors or how to do this. And you see it click. Just like Dave, for some reason, Lucas must have never said like spaghetti Western in his life, even though we all know that some of the basis is of that. He must have said Kurosaki and like, oh, hey, we're all watching Jumbo and we're all watching, you know, the Seven Samurais. Mm-hmm. Cool, because he knew that. But he and, and and he said it. He's like, that's what I was kind of trying to talk to John about. Was like based off of those and and uh, Lone or Wolf Wolf and Cub. What was that? Lone Graphic Wolf and Cub. Cub. Lone yeah. Wolf. Lone Wolf and Cub. Cub. Of course, Lucas is a big fan of Akira Kurosawa and all those uh, old flicks um of course like you said the lone wolf and cub stuff um i think that it would be smart for anybody who's taking on the star wars stuff to look at that to a deep dive through it. and we might yeah. we might go into that a little bit in a different video we might go into some of those and the, the similarities between that but you but when you're doing that you have to also see the link to um star wars and it's funny because the one thing dave said was like then i realized han solo was dressed like a gunslinger like oh yeah 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 he definitely was he definitely was. and the other thing the model too that you want to make sure that you that we go along with too especially if we talk about it some other time is is campbell's hero's journey too yes. and you know lucas was always very vocal about using that model to tell his story because he knew it was successful i mean that was the whole reason for writing the book in the first place was campbell saying okay what is the thing that makes all these great pieces of literature great pieces of literature it yeah. is a very specific formula and lucas was like well, why wouldn't i use that um and i think that all of the good pieces of film and literature have used to some degree that model um with the right um with the right sort of um i don't know attempts at showing it so cinematography is huge and that's where we get into the kurosawa stuff and we get into um dog fighting world war one world war two uh, there's a lot stuff. of movies we get into they took that stuff off of too. yeah i mean we yeah. can get to that one time it, it 
so you know all now this is all Dave's background, right? But let's talk about what he likes to do now, specifically what Dave likes to do. And this is why it's important because if Dave starts taking over live action, he, just like Lucas, gets into a rut of certain things. And the one thing that he loves more than anything else is characters and, and certain characters and usually off characters and usually characters you see in a background of a movie or a one off character or just or just mentioned mentioned off thing. Like we all know Ahsoka and we're gonna get into Ahsoka in a little bit. But Sabine's another one. Like we can get into the three majors. So let's do that. Let's do that first. Let's get into Ahsoka, Mike. You you love Ahsoka. I love Ahsoka, but you love her more. So let's get let's get into Ahsoka. Get, let's, <laughs> let's get a rundown of Ahsoka, how she started out, and you know, kind of like even maybe a little glimpse. We'll deep dive into it way later about where we see the, the upcoming stuff going on. But let's get into like just a little history of Ahsoka from Snips. Who was her blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Go through there. Do we know sure. where Filoni had the idea come from? Like, what was he basing Ahsoka around? Do we have that information? Uh, yeah. We have a, we have, yes. we have, And we also have an early, we have early sketches. And they come actually in the Blu-ray, uh, the, the Blu-ray pack. There's an early sketch showing what Ahsoka is supposed to look like. She is essentially supposed to be a young uh, to is it Togruta? Is that yeah. the name of the the race? Uh, yeah. Young Togruta, like Shakti. Um, yeah. So it was to take a Shakti like character um, who resonated really well. It was a great design, um, very regal looking design. Um, make a kid version out of that and give Anakin his Padawan. Um, and then in the movie, the essentially the the it's really just the first three episodes mashed together and put into a put into cinema. Um, the character exists as a fairly young Padawan. She is rather annoying in that movie. She's very kind of yippy yappy and she gets the nickname Snips early on in, in the film. And she's not the greatest character through those first three episodes. However, the vision was clearly to pull her out of that fairly quickly because when we get back into season one pretty much right away she pretty much already becomes an awesome character midway through the season once we get past sort of the monster of the week episodes and they start to get into real story arcs in season two she is already coming to it coming into her own she's already seeing anakin's flaws she's already seeing how she can work with uh what her talents are what she's learning from anakin um she becomes much more mature very quickly. Um, we see her maturing, um, not only physically, but also mentally and through the force and all those kinds of things. And it, it's done on purpose. I mean, just look at the figure line. We'll get into the action figures later, but there's a very clear delineation between Ahsoka's ages. When you see her first figure, she looks like a little girl. You see her second and third figure, she's starting to look like a teenager. You start to see her fourth and fifth figure, she's beginning to look like an adult. It's not by accident. Um, and no. that coming of age story is timeless uh, from catcher in the rye all the way through, you know, all the way through star Wars, that whole Ahsoka becomes the, That's the female Luke story every day. All star Wars journeys start with a teacher and it's great yep. to see Ahsoka's teacher being Anakin who also went through this journey. So um, it's not, so this is where I think you're wrong. I think it was, they were trying to do that as like a little teenager thing because we got to remember everybody thinks it's Anakin who was it. But if you remember the movie, Paul Clune was actually the person who found her, brought her in and was her mentor for a couple of years. To sort of, sort of finish that off, I think what's great about Ahsoka and I think all the way from her being annoying, like we all kind of are when we're young, all the way to her adult sort of very um, intelligent, um, careful yeah. sort of thing. I think that, she is our first female everyman in Star Wars. We had Han before, or maybe Luke, or whomever you want to point to, but now we get the girl version. And I think that her design from start to finish was, I think it was perfect, at least from an animation standpoint. And I think now we'll see what she can do live action. Yeah, so I agree. Like, I think that it was very calculated, her being super annoying like a super annoying kid is because she was a kid yeah. at that point i mean and that was great i think that was all planned out but brian one thing i want to hit back is when you say who was really her master or teacher in the in the beginning it was paul coon and and the, the story behind that is and this is where the dave part comes in that's dave's all-time favorite character and, and a lot of people are gonna be like who are you talking about and literally it's a guy who was on the jedi council and like didn't have a lot. You might have known. Maybe got a little slayed by a young Palpatine. Like, 
that's the type of character, and he loved them. And and then he does the whole storyline where he has them fighting underwater um, with uh, what's their names? The the it's a trap. The Moncal. The Moncal. I mean, he starts do, building into yeah. that, and you could see that. And maybe later on when we get into it, where there's a gapping area of storylines of Ahsoka that still hasn't been tapped. But Ahsoka's storyline doesn't just – Ahsoka's storyline is so good that it doesn't just end with Clone Wars or with Rebels. And we'll get into Rebels in a little bit. But they came out with a novel. Was it 16 or 17? Whenever it was, it was pretty early on on the redone of canon. And I think a lot of us – and Mike, I might be wrong on this, but I thought they were going to do like – I thought the last four episodes would probably be at one point – in, in uh, the last Clone Wars that came up, the, the Disney Plus stuff, the last season, I thought they would have done Son of Death and Mirror. And when they came out with what they came out with, and for those that don't know, in the Ahsoka book, there are little snippets, like two or three pages that they throw in that are kind of like a flashback or flash forward area in it. And it's it's the summary of what Dave ended up do it so they must so i mean it's dave's footprint so somebody either rewrote what dave said or dave put those in there and then eventually that becomes the full version of it, it becomes the last bit the last four or five episodes of clone wars the the arc of ahsoka in clone wars so you can right. see this is a character that he's not going away from and i you know i know they're saying like oh she might show up in i mean there's the world betweens well go ahead start talking about rebels then so we've already covered now, now we've covered the book now we cover Cold Wars. Let's start talking about Rebels and what, where he developed her character further down the line. There. Yeah. So, so then, essentially, he 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 has Ahsoka go through this catharsis where she uh, has to leave the Jedi Order in order to 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 leave what she doesn't believe in anymore. Um, she thinks that they're corrupt. She thinks that there's 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 problems. There's infighting. There's arrogance. And she needs, in order to find herself, she needs to leave. And she leaves the shows for a while. Um, and when she finally pops back up as Fulcrum, essentially, she's an adult at this point, and she becomes uh, an integral part in the end part of the rebel storytelling. Um, and then, which of course will then push itself into this weird final season of Clone Wars that we get back after Rebels. Um, so here we have Rebels. We, we're telling all these stories of these new characters again. We go down the Dave rabbit hole one more time. We get we latch on to Kanan. We latch on to Hera. We latch on to you know even Zeb. Um, and, but of course Sabine, who gets Wait, her own really good art. Are you talking about Zeb, the original Chewbacca Zeb? That's that's what you're talking about. The original yeah. Chewbacca Zeb. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. uh, yes. Con uh, uh, concept drawing Chewbacca Zeb uh, Aurelius. I think is his last yeah, name. Zeb Aurelius. Um, uh, he, uh, I mean, they, they, they are, they're very well designed characters. So here we are, we're immersed in this we, We're a few seasons in, and then we get this cloaked character, um, who don't we see her in a hologram first before we even see her, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, okay, and then we're like, oh my God, just like everything so else. And I went to celebration and you probably did too, Marco. And Dave Filoni came out in a shirt that says Ahsoka lives question mark. <laughs> Because no one was sure what happened to her, whether she had died or not. They take a break. Uh, they show something on the screen. He comes back. He's torn the question mark off, and it's Ahsoka Liv's exclamation, exclamation point. point. The crowd goes absolutely crazy because everybody sees his shirt. Everybody realizes is that at that moment that Ahsoka's alive. Um, and then, of course, we, we get to see her in Rebels and yeah, we get to uh, see now as an adult. And we get to see the Twitter. Oh, we get to see the Twitter fan art of her on the horse with the hood Ooh. thing on. Yeah. So this. Yeah. Is, so so now look. So now we've developed a character, and and there's a couple more points in there that we might have to hit on, but because they can be opened up later. But he has now changed yep. it around. Where now for mar merchandising, like this is what the best part about him. He does a full range. So now we have different lightsabers because after she leaves, she gets different lightsabers. Then she gets the white lightsabers. She has a different look. So now there's a whole nother line for looks, and there's more stories for that. Yeah. There you go. So now she's got that. But what the what he also did was he created the world in between. Why the world in yes. between is important. So what? So the world in between is this. Ooh. Yeah, it's hard to explain. By the way, it's gonna we're gonna get a little. Crazy. Sit back. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let you take this one. I'm gonna sit back and listen. <laughs> so what I'm gonna tell you is what Dave said about the world in between. Time traveling is fake, people. It doesn't really exist. So I can pretty much make up whatever I want about time traveling because it doesn't really exist in Star Wars. It doesn't really exist in, in real life. So 
take it with a grain of salt. But what they do is they create that he creates this way where he can bring Darth Vader back in, which will give us the emotional connection because he always does. He crosses generations with this all the time. But he also gives the option where, OK, I between Clone Wars and Rebels, Ahsoka disappeared from cinema, but she showed up in the novel. OK, so I gave you your little taste there. OK, now I'm bringing her back in this thing. But guess what I'm also doing? I'm giving you we still have the beginning where she got picked up and that whole backstory. We haven't even cleared that up yet. OK, we don't know. We don't know where Plo got her. Like, we don't know that. We don't know what happened between then and when she got dropped on the ship. And and Anakin's like, hey, Obi-Wan, here's your new Padawan. And he's like, not any mine. It's yours. Like, we don't know what happened between that period. So that's a good period right there. And then the in-between, because he pretty much said, I can do whatever I want. That's when he said this character is going nowhere and I can do whatever I want because he honestly can. I mean, she could show up wherever there's so many years she could the stuff that they have about the high Republic. She could show up in the high Republic. Cause all we know is that you can go through a door somehow and be at any time period. <laughs> and like, it doesn't matter if you interfere over there because that stuff's thrown out. It's not like the, uh, butterfly effect or whatever. What's it yeah, called? Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, right. Yeah, the there's back none to of that. the future, the back to the future concept of the time space travel. time continuum. Yeah, yeah. It, none of that. He said flat out, those don't. None of that's real. None of that is real. So I can do whatever I want. So now you have this area where you're like, who is he going to? Because because when you saw the writing show up in that in in the novel, you know that he might never say this, but read that novel, watch Clone Wars, and tell me that that he didn't pick that person out to write the book. Like he didn't pick the Arthur out. Cause I think it's great who writes it. Whoever it is, tell me that he didn't pick her out to write that book. Cause he did. Cause those little inserts are directly into his storyline. So imagine this, he's in charge of live action. All right, everybody. I mean, Rose, she's been trying to play. Uh, she's been trying to play him for years. It was always recommended that she would. The age is the in between, which she would fit perfectly into there could be a show coming up with her being the live action. I need to go on public record as saying that I'm pissed off for Ashley Eckstein. And look, I know Ashley was very, very, uh, she was very gracious about the news. And I think she handled it like a, like a true gentlewoman. However, the character is Ashley. If my son, who's watched Clone Wars, walks up to Rosario Dawson and she talks to him, he's going to go, oh, hi. If she, if he walks up to Ashley Eckstein and she says, oh, hi, like a sister, he's going to flip out because she is, she's, Ahsoka is, my son is hot Soka. I mean, you can't, you can't do any, you can't do any wrong. Ahsoka is the character. It's like his girlfriend. She is, she has made the character, her voice, the way she's worked that character and the way that she has marketed herself as Ahsoka has done had- a lot. Has done a lot to make the character popular. I agree to a point, and here's what I will say about this. Rosario Dawson is a trained actor, actress. True. She's a trained live action actress. And that's about the only reason I could see uh, them deciding to even not even think about Ashley and Rosario and, and put, you know, who should be. But that being said, I can understand. I'm just being a fanboy. I was about to say, I can understand why fanboys get angry because Ashley is a big part of that character. So a this huge is part of that character. This and is the only so issue sweet. I have with it. This is the only issue I have with it. And, and you know, I'm not sure if she is showing up in the next episode because of when the timing was for everything. I know they're, that they're probably planning on something eventually with her. So we don't know for sure if Dawson is going to be it or not. I, I would say it's a good casting because, yes, you're right, she's an actor. So the one thing that's really dirty is when that rumor came out, less than a week before that Eckley did a interview and she had said, this is it. There will be no more Soka. You know, they told me we're not doing any pretty much inferred that the character from this point on wouldn't be presented. They weren't going to do more animation on her and it was going to be done. And then if they do, I don't think we can debate what's going to happen with Mandalorian. I absolutely think they're going to do a live action and I think they're going to do a young version, and I think they probably are going to do an older version, like I just said, because of the in between, they got to do it. I don't think you could use use Ashley there, but I I also don't think somebody who has been so instrumental instrumental in what she has done because she started that clothing line and that girl fan club and everything else. I don't think I think you kind of did her dirty where you have her in an interview. 
But in in me and I don't I'm not sure that their, their rumor was true. So like it is what it is. But even at that, don't tell her the door's closed on the character, right? Like she went on an interview and said, like, yeah, man, I wish they would do more, but the door's closed. I was told the door's closed on the character, pretty much, is what she said. Especially right after you've just done the opposite when you told her you were gonna do the final season of Clone Wars. You got her all excited, the character was coming back, you were gonna voice her, then you were gonna do the voice for her in the in the Rise of Skywalker film as well. So to give her that, and then to just be like Okay, now we're done. That's the end. You've you've closed. You've wrapped up the character. Oh, but wait, we're gonna put her in the Mandalorian. We're gonna give her her own show, uh, and we're gonna give her to somebody else. If they if they do, I mean, if they if, put her in if they put her in the Mandalorian, and that would be a good way to open up the in between. I'm not just like the whole reporting of that news, and we can talk another episode about how like in development and that stuff works. But like that that was pretty much in the can. They're already in post edit at the at the point because they're already starting on re- writing three when that yep. rumor broke. And yeah, the, so we're probably right. not going to see any Ahsoka, uh, if anything, till the maybe last episode. Yeah, if you have Ahsoka yeah, stuff that you're, if you have Ahsoka stuff that you're storing up to sell, I don't think now's the time to sell. I think when no. you, I, I think no. when they, I think when they start to reveal the in between, what they're going to do with that, when they do the buddy cop movie that they're going to do between Sabine and her, like, hey, how you doing? Like, speaking of Sabine, this is why we know Sabine's going to be a good character. Because when you go to con and you see cosplay, like that's yeah, cosplay's it. Like I know people always say cosplayers have no money in their pocket, so they don't spend any money. You're wrong. They spend money. They're just not spending money with you on the right because, stuff. Yeah, because right. you, yeah, yeah, because you either don't have the right stuff, or they already own that type of stuff. So you're way behind it. And when you see, so when you start seeing those people spending thousands of dollars. Professional cosplayers, professional podcasters, professional whatever, and there's some famous ones that had done her before, come out onto the floor of a con, and you're seeing two, three, four of these characters. And I'm not talking like, hey, I threw this out together over the weekend. I'm talking like, yeah, they could have cast like, you I've for that for part. Years on this cast. They could have yeah, cast yeah, you yeah, for that exactly. part. That's when you right. know that that character is going to take off, and the, and the better stuff, not always the more expensive, but the rare stuff you can find on one of those characters, I will suggest to you that is a good reason to get up and go to cons and support your local cons, even your small con shows. Go out there and see who's people, who people pretending there are cosplaying. Pretend, I probably shouldn't say pretending. Cosplaying, who are they cosplaying? We got to take it seriously because it is. And, and the money's there, okay? And yep. I do show. We've seen I, it in the Marvel Universe. I mean, when you, know, when you go to a show and you see uh, 100 girls dressed as Spider-Gwen, and not Harley Quinn, yeah. you're like, oh, okay, this yeah. is the next trend in comics. We, I better go buy my Spider my Spider Gwen stuff. Yeah, with Spider Gwen, uh, I think be, the same thing for Star Wars. Exactly. People were not there were not a lot of people who were fans of Spider Gwen when she first came off. It, oh, we gotta have a female Spider Man. I don't care, man, because Spider Gwen is me. <laughs> like, because but he's right that that's what I like. I do a lot of my stuff off of what my kids love, cosplayers do, and what I see on the con floor. And it and it always works. Pre- it's always worked pretty well. I mean, you get a bomb here or there, and sometimes you'll accidentally guess on something that's not right. I do my best to remember all the time as a Star Wars fan why I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm a Star Wars fan because of the way it made me feel when I was seven, when I was four, when I was whatever. And I try to bring myself back there every single time, and I try to enjoy each and every part of this as a kid and to see it through the eyes of a kid. And when I see a kid standing at Ashley Eckstein's table or watching uh, Sakaar come out on stage. And I see the joy in their face that I had when I was five. That's when I know that the thing is, is right. That's when I know it's real. That's when I know that it's going to be a, a hit again. And I try, try to remember it that way. I try not to be the 43 year old fanboy. I try not to be this bitter um, mf about new, about new, movies and I, I try I try not to be that negative guy. I try not to be that internet troll. I just want to enjoy this stuff like a kid and I love to see kids enjoying it like I did. Um, and I think that th- that's why I'm so big on characters like Sabine, like Ahsoka, like Thrawn, uh, which we haven't gotten into yet. Um, characters that I see the excitement. I see that same level of oh my god, the jaw dropping thing that we had when we were kids and I think that makes me understand that the future of star wars is 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 pretty good especially in the hands of a guy that created these characters yeah um, i think it's that's the way we're going 
So I agree 100%, but the, I will always do the stuff for kids and the cosplayer. But what I also do is, like we were saying earlier, check out what still the people our age and younger are going after too. And that's a huge care. So it's good to, it's good to mind these little characters that the kids love. They're your first test subject. The young people is your first test. Subject yeah. in there. But don't forget the people who aren't loud and yelling my star Wars, because some of the people are like that. And those people that that's the core fandom. Like, look, I'm never dressing up as, I mean, I do with my kids for Halloween, but if it's not Halloween, you're never going to catch me dressing up as a star Wars character or any other character. Me either. Matter. I don't do it, but I'm also not a guy that's going to go on there and start yelling about how wrong you are because you like a character or something else. You'll see a shirt that I wear. You'll see me buy something. Maybe you'll come around and see that. And, you know, Mike, I know you do too. Some of us spent big money on Star Wars stuff. Now I'm a little bit more sure frugal, do. so I try to get all my stuff very, very cheap. Uh, but with that being said, like there's still a market. There's all types of markets. There's so many markets in Star Wars, and that's what makes Star Wars great because it is literally every element of Star Wars is for everybody. Just might not be for you. If you don't want to have a replica piece, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars. You don't have to. You can get a knockoff, and you can get a knockoff of the knockoff. You we we go. We're going to go into that stuff later on how many different, you know areas there are for that but the truth of the matter is or you can get the real 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 deal or you can get the real real deal which we also show (laughs) but that's the good thing about star wars and there's a market for all of it there's a market for the first gen there's a market for the second gen for generation so for people that don't know toys or anything usually has a generation okay there's a market for all of it reprints is a lot of thing people know so there's a market for all that stuff it doesn't matter. It just depends on what the market is. When they think about, you know, people say, well, the real collectibles are the vintage stuff, man. I want to, Darth Vader is going to cost me, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars carded. I'm like, okay, so you don't think there's anything that's modern that, that costs that? Well, this little baby, try getting your hands on one of these right now for less than three hundred dollars. And this figure is only five years old. So yeah. I mean, um, it costs there's plenty, stuff. there's plenty of people that want this and this big bucks in the modern stuff now too. So and depending it, on what your generation is, it's, it's, it's what they want to go get. What did they, what did, what resonated with them when they saw it? That's what drives value. And, and I think that we're going to, we're going to continue to see it, you know, so go try to find yourself a Mandalorian figure right now. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's part of it too, is like we, you know, we've been asked for a while, especially with star Wars stuff blowing up, especially with the repopulation of like the Mandalorian show. We've been hit up a lot and people have asked us, questions and just not just questions like what's hot but like why is what is this we don't understand star wars and that's what we're going to keep trying to do is explain it to you like this is what it is but the the key core there is understand that there's a lot of it out there yes it can be overwhelming you don't have to know everything you don't have to get into everything there's certain key things you should like dave and his characters and then when he takes one of timothy zane's characters and does something with it too (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah like, and you know zon zon zon, Z- zon i think that's how zon, you say it zon zon, zon is zon's a, an interesting guy because he's been around since the beginning of the expanded universe heir to the empire novels etc um and a lot of short story stuff too um and i think that the zon stuff is probably the, well, but like but go back a second lucas said at one point if i'm going to make another trilogy it's going to be the zon books he put a lot of stock into that and there's no way that Dave didn't hear that somewhere along the line. Um, and I think that's partially why we're seeing Thrawn be such an important character uh, in Rebels and moving forward. I think we're going to see a lot more of him. What Zahn was doing then is what Filoni is doing now. I think people saw those stories back then for the first time and went, there's other really great Star Wars stories to tell that aren't just the original trilogy. And I think that that is being done again and Zahn's still around still writing novels still doing what he was doing then and I think he's also a great resource for Dave and others and John Favreau and whomever else is in charge Kathleen Kennedy. Um, and I think that mining him is important I think his stuff his character building was great too especially with a character like Thrawn so I think, and I think too, we're going to see a lot more of him I agree and I think what you see is on, it's the difference between the Dave error and the George error right when you go back and you read Timothy's books, Heir to the Empire, the trilogy, and then you read the New Thrawn trilogy, and in my opinion, the mm-hmm. New Thrawn trilogy is, and I'm not taking anything away from Heir of the Empire where it was, but it looked like Timothy was handcuffed there, right? It really did. It, it, there was definitely a thing where George was getting in there. 
And then you see Dave's method where he kind of goes, hey, look, these are the things you can't do. You can't kill off certain characters. You can't do whatever. You have to keep it in a certain timeline, but not the – because it is a different timeline, right? Like when we're, we're going to do – we're talking – we'll talk about Thrawn a little bit more, but it is a different timeline. It's not the same story. It really is not the same story at all. It's kind of like a prototype. It's like, like when we, a lot of us know comic books and stuff like that or toys. It's a prototype. Heir to the Empire has now become a prototype. The new Thrawn thing has become the origin, okay? And – Yep. That's kind of how canon works. And it's crazy what he did. And I, I, you see that Dave lets them take their hands off or whoever's in charge of Star Wars, but he was in charge of the story group. So you have to give the credit to Dave on that. He let him go with it. And what Timothy rewrote when he actually rewrote their origin and the new origin or, and the whole storyline and then folded it into Rebels, that character and that's – it's all original, all better. There's no, But it feels like Star Wars, right? It, it feels like – something to do with Star Wars. And I, and I think if that keeps going on, there's other books and other ways to do it. And you'll see they'll start reincorporating some of the, and you see it already. They're reincorporating a lot of the stuff that became non-canon, but that opens the door right. for cleaning well, Thrawn, up. Thrawn got his new, Thrawn got his new comic book series that started him all over again. It was a short lived mini series, but still it was a, Hey, don't forget about this character. He's super important. We're going to remind you why. And that was the first novel. So they pretty much re redid the first novel in comic book form, not air, the first right. novel of the new era of the canon era. They redid that novel, right. Thrawn. I mean, Matina right. stole the cover from the dust jacket. I mean, that Matina. It's exactly. Yeah, I know. He stole it from the dust yeah. jacket and people love the dust jacket on that. So he stole that. And it's great. I mean, it's a good book. Like it is what it is, but it's, it's yeah. literally printed out that way. And how they did that, I mean, that's, imp I have never, I mean, think about a character where they had had it and the origin is more, the new reversion, redone version of the character is, if not, it's more popular, flat out, it's more popular than the original version. And and that's how Thrawn works. Um, the, that new, it's it. I mean, he's going to come up with nine books now. It's going to be a full nine book arc from what I hear. I know he's getting six books for sure. I heard now it might be nine total yeah. books. And that, that's crazy. But at the same time, there's a want for it. There really is a want for it. And that character is another character where people – all the cons I went to, I never saw people dressing in that white dress, blue face. You'd see one guy every once in a while uh, with the black <laughs> hair do it. You yeah. see him now. Like you see him. And that's not an easy costume to pull off really. And and they're loving it. The pin that was at Celebration. I mean you know the ones you the ones that went. Ahsoka, Thrawn, and uh, – Sabine. And Sabine. Those were the pins that were like, yep. they were gone. And they were on the reseller's wall for tons. Of resellers were paying a premium to buy that and then reselling it for a premium. That's crazy, man. Yep. That What happened at Celebration was and, crazy. Uh, I was present at a conversation with Timothy Zahn and um, Pablo Hidalgo. Yeah. Um, and while I can't discuss what they were discussing, what I can say is I was very intrigued to see how excited Zahn was to continue conversations about Thrawn. Um, it was, he looked like a little kid having a conversation and it was really great. He loves the character. He's really excited to be able to continue it. I think we're going to see some really cool material come out from it. And, uh, and I think it's going to get utilized. I think Dave would be dumb not to utilize that stuff in upcoming live action or upcoming animated or whatever it happens to be. The character's good. He's a favorite. He, uh, like you said, he's been reinvented in a way that now the new generation of Star Wars fans know who he is. He's not, and he, no longer is he a, a 1990s novel character. He is now a current canonized Disney Plus character. And for everybody that doesn't know the yeah. Heir to the Empire story, the Heir to the Empire story was so handcuffed that it had a lot of elements of a bunch of other stories that were being done at the time. There was kind yep. of a Star Wars, floor, and they were both done. So they're both done through Del Rey. It's still the writing house. It was the writing house then when Timothy was doing it over there too. Timothy did it over there, but it was very handcuffed, and there was a lot of regurgitated stuff that occurred. The cloning things, the the, yep. the Luke Sauer, it, it, Plus, it took place at a different it, different period of time. So now, just to explain the timeline and stuff, I'm going to. If you don't want to hear spoilers, which you probably do, or if you did, well, I don't care. The book's been out long enough. You should probably have read it. If you haven't, turn off your thing. <laughs> I don't care. Okay. If you, if you don't want spoilers, yeah. don't listen to this because we're going to spoil everything. For you've you. had plenty of time. Yeah, you've yeah. had plenty. Of time. <laughs> we're not going to spoil things that just come out, but we're going to spoil this. At one point, Thrawn takes somebody from the Empire, some just off landish character that doesn't mean anything the guy's not really happy with his lot in life he just wants to be a logistics guy and he ends up shipping him out to where he's from okay so he ends up shipping him out to where he's from and 
So he takes this logistic guy and just ships him back home pretty much. And the third book kind of talks about what's being adjusted there. The working theory is that they hyperdrive to that part of the outer outer rim. So outer rim is like outer space area. It's, it's, when you come down to Star Wars, you have the main area, which has already kind of been developed. Then you have wild space, outer rim area. So it's between outer rim and wild space where they're going, which is areas that they have they refer to it a lot. They do refer to them sporadically. There hasn't been a lot of development out there. Um, there was in the non-canon, and I don't want to confuse people. Uh, we will talk about canon and non-canon, and we'll talk about some of the stuff that happened there. Because there, there was definitely some very intriguing wars, battles. Think about it this way. For those that aren't aware, because um, we, we have a variety of people listening. Those that aren't aware, the central system or the central system of planets essentially starts at Coruscant, that is the capital planet, and moves out to all the planets that you've heard of, all the Uweens, essentially, uh, Dantooine, Tatooine, um, Yavin, Endor, all that kind, of, all the planets that you've heard from in the movies. Then, as you go out again, you get into the outer rim and the unexplored wild space, wild space. Um, which leaves a lot more room for story. Um, and a, it, and there's hyperspace routes and all that kind of thing that you know it, it gets complicated, and it some does. of that stuff's been explored, and some that hasn't. So the key is a lot of the stuff that you see, and you're going to see in in both the animated series is there, but there is, they are, they have already developed these two other Milky way outer rim areas. And we know because of non-canon that they have gone there before they're changing them up. We know that from the Thrawn books, from the Timothy books, but they're going to hit them up and it's going to be in the future. And we think that's where we think they're going to do a live, if not another animated, but a live version of, you know, Thrawn, Ezra, and introduce them to this character yeah. that we know that's out there in the Empire right now and actually is in one of the Thrawn comic books because that's where they, you know, that's the novelization. So his first would be in one of those. Um, and he's going to run there and already have something set up for it. That's what our opinion and it is what it is, is. And it's going to be great because then now you have a whole new mining area that you can, you can start developing. Um, yeah. And you don't have to worry about what was and what wasn't canon before because – Technically, most of it's unexplored, or it's so it's so briefly explored that you're not going to ruin anything that's in the canonized films or the big shows. You can pretty much start from scratch, except for one big war that took place out there. But besides that, well, it took place yes, on of the course. Basics, but yes, yes. But besides that, yes, which I think they'll eventually. Right. Yeah. Okay. So they have to um, at least mention that they do. Yep. When they have to, well, I think they have to bring it in because, like that, in the books. See, I'm really trying not to spoil the books because I know I said spoilers. Count, I know. But like, I'm trying not to spoil them. <laughs> You're books. doing a good job, though. Because in the books, they do bring up that race of aliens, and they do bring up that it's kind of a fighting area, and and that's whole, the whole point of them hyperspacing out there. And I'm trying not to ruin what we think they're going to do with Ezra, but it's going to be really cool. And if you read the books, you might get a really big clue or listen to them on audio. Uh, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. And and with Dave in charge of that. The audio books are really good, by the way. Those are, are really well done. The audio book for that series is, is really. Yeah, that's cool. No, yeah, yeah. Just a, that's just no. a side note. But yeah, I mean, they are worth listening to. They did good. a good job on those. Good. One of the things that Thrawn's people would use to blast through hyperspace and why it's important is they use force, people who have the force gift. And that's how they yep. were fighting it because they would be able to predict they would teach them, and especially younger ones, they'd be able to teach them how to jump through space to avoid things, and that's how they'd fight them. So that's cool. when you see an Ezra being jumped out there, you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be – because if he gets into those wars, that's a whole nother that's, – that's, that's a whole nother see, three What they're movie. doing is they're slowly bringing all the stuff that – pissed all the fans off when when kathleen kennedy said we're not doing that none of that's canon anymore they're slowly turning that around well it was well it, it was yep. in, in my opinion don't put this out there it was bad it was bad because yeah. it was handcuffed it was garbage go back and read that i mean i read up i mean okay jabba's palace was pretty funny they turned that into they kind of took that format and put it into from a certain point of view and we're not going to give you the difference completely between canon stories and non-canon stories we can do that later and everything else but let's talk about what happened right so at one point Somebody, and I know Kennedy was the one who, who vocalized it, was like, we're getting rid of all the old stories. I know this has been a little bit decisive or divisive between people of the fandom. But when you look at what they've done now, 
if you go pound for pound, story against storyline, and character development against character development, there was a lot of hand. I guess the only word I could put is handcuffs. Like there was a lot of handcuffs on those early books that kind of didn't let them hold up. Like they, they turned out pretty. I don't. Mike's what's the right word for it? I mean, not. I'm not saying bad because I don't want to knock them because we've seen the same writers. But you're right. They had so they had these restrictions that allowed them to not really be unique. Um, stories that 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 would stand the test of time, like a like a Shakespeare play might, or something like that, right? Well, I mean, that's three. that's a little bit lofty. Yeah, but even the original yeah. three series, they weren't allowed to do stuff. Where I think the decision play. was made in order to say, look, we know that we've got some really good stuff in here to mine eventually, but if we throw it all away, then we at least can get rid of all the crap, <laughs> and then we can pull back in the threads that we think are usable for later without disrupting any of what we've already done. So those things can exist. Fans can still enjoy them. There's nothing wrong with having them be out there. They still sell them. But understand that we may take those threads and move them in a new direction, like we did with Thrawn, for instance. Read those first 107 Marvel comics and tell oh me that. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, tell me that you, and tell me that you want 108th issue because no, you don't. <laughs> you don't. I mean, but there was some cool stuff. There's some cool stuff that didn't even fit in there, and we could get down there that that later. But th there's also stuff we see now that they're they are. Thrawn's not the only one they're bringing back. I mean, there's guys that we have right. already started to speculate on, maybe or like guys that were like, "Oh, I'm so glad they're rewriting this character," um, because they're doing them better. They really are doing them better, and I think that's Dave's influence. Getting back to Dave, even though we're not supposed to. I think it's a Dave influence. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you, and it, it's going to be my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. The stuff that's coming out now is going to win the battle of what's going to be more valuable. The legacy stuff is all going to be prototype stuff because, and these these are the reasons why people already own that stuff, and there was so much of it they bought into it really cheap. The market for that stuff is not nearly as big as the stuff that's coming out right now. It really is. There's only a couple of it. I have I have a caveat to that. Oh, okay. Right. There, yes. 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 Uh, Go ahead. And my caveat to that is that during the dark horse era of comic books, then this is this is really the only place. Dark horse readership for dark horse star wars started to die um and as that happened the print runs got low but but in order to try to bolster sales they would do all these really weird uh variants usually convention variants or some oddity and they were often extremely low print runs one in 500 one of 500 one of a thousand or less um the ahsoka for 50 or less even some are 100 yeah. 150 Right. So now those, if those are also keys, i.e. they contain the first appearance of a character, whether or not that character gets retconned or not, the, that, those books, those few books, and there's maybe only a handful of them, 12, 20 of them, something like that. The Ahsoka one of 1000, Dark Horse 100, Clone Wars number one issue is the famous one right now because it's like a $2,000 book. But that's not the only one that's like that. Wow. There's a, there's that's there's the first Darth Bane. We'll talk about this more in depth some other day. But that's the one caveat I have to value. That's the only stuff I would say that you should go yeah. try to track down now because those things are they're ghosts. They're already and they're ghosts. just not going to pop up. And there is some there's certainly some right. rare the sketch ages and stuff. I mean, there's certainly some rare stuff there. But the truth of it was was it, it's always been about good storylines, and that's kind of what we're seeing the transition now. Canon's giving us good storylines again. Okay. Not all Dark Horse was good storylines. Okay, wasn't. Nope. Amen. <laughs> was no, not. The one thing I think that we're going to see eventually is is the is other Sith pop up. Knights of the Old Republic was a video game. Okay, it was a video yes. game that people fell Fantastic in love with. Video game. Yeah. Yes. yes, it's a great video game, and it sometimes Xbox will sell it for the remastered version for like free. So when they do, check the free thing if you got Gold Live and you can get it there and play through it. It still kind of holds up. Um, Kind of like Super Mario Bros. Where there holds up the you know you're playing eight bit or whatever. But my point is this: that has become it was like the first cult following, legitimately cult following thing, right? It ended up getting tabletop games that were extremely low print and extremely popular that came out of it. It ended up starting like a Geo City where they did a just the fans ended up starting their own like storyline thing that it eventually got adapted and they ended up doing back storylines for a lot of this stuff. It came out with a second video game because it was so freaking popular. The characters have action figures, up. action figures. Yes. It, everything came out of there, but it was not mainstream. Like you had to be a star Wars fan to know this stuff. 
but yep. it was selling. Like it sells and people have it and they hold on to it. What people they did a dark horse series off of it too. And the dark horse series was okay. The problem was it's like spread across arcs because they kind of gave up on it and then would bring bring it back and remake it back. And the arcs would do well. No individual first appearance because the first appearance was really video games, how a lot of Star Wars fans saw it. And I think that's kind of something people forget. Maybe there will be a lead into first appearances in print. But you have to remember when you're going after first appearances and you're paying a premium and then you're saying, why can't I sell it again for a premium a year later? It's not just that people might already have it. It also might be that the mindset in Star Wars for years is that's technically not their first appearance. Their first appearance, even right. in a gra- graphic or something else, could have been in a role-playing uh, uh, a game or something like that. It kind of gets into that element where that's not the most valuable thing as the arc as a whole would be more valuable to him. The whole story would be more valuable uh, than the first appearance. So that's something just to think about there. 